Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on hydrophone directivity and spatial averaging. We'll begin by defining what we mean by hydrophone directivity. This is the variation of a hydrophone sensitivity as a function of angle. Whilst angle of incidence is important, it's not the only factor influencing directivity. Directional response also depends upon sensor radius and wave number which in turn means there's a dependency on wavelength and thus on frequency and speed of sound of propagation in the medium of interest. What causes a hydrophone to have directional response? We'll consider here a hydrophone active element shown in cross-section. Plane waves are incident upon this hydrophone active element and their direction of propagation is shown by the dotted line. We can see that because of the orientation of the hydrophone active element, the normal to its surface makes an angle theta to the direction of propagation. This means that as wave fronts propagate forward, they will encounter the right hand edge of the hydrophone active element first. There will then be a slight time shift before they encounter the centre of the hydrophone, and another time shift again before they encounter the left hand edge of the hydrophone. And we can see here the relationship between those time shifts, sensor radius, and the angle of incidence. We recall that time shift can be expressed as phase shift for a given frequency. We also recall from interference theory that when the phase shift between two sinusoids is an odd number of pi radians, we get destructive interference. An even number of pi radians phase shift leads to constructive interference. The signal output by a hydrophone is the average or integral of pressure experienced across the hydrophone surface. As a consequence, if some of these pressure components are out of phase with one another, we can see constructive and destructive interference effects, and therefore there will be maxima and minima in the hydrophone's directional response. It's also important to note that there may be other features contributing to directivity not least of which the structures on which the hydrophone active element is based. However, you get the general idea. Consider here a hydrophone active element that is large relative to the wavelengths it's being used to measure. Here, we're looking at signals in the one to 10 megahertz range. And we can see that even at one megahertz, the lowest frequency of interest in this chart, there is a 10 dB fall off from normal incidence by the time we achieve plus or minus 40 degrees. Similarly, a signal that's 10 dB below the peak is achieved at 10 megahertz by changing the angle of incidence by only plus or minus three degrees. A hydrophone of this size would be very, very sensitive to angular misalignment during experimentation. In contrast, we'll consider a 0.2 millimeter needle hydrophone. Here we can see that even at 5 MHz, the fall off from the normal incidence amplitude is only 10 dB at plus or minus 80 degrees. And even the 40 MHz response is broader than we were seeing than the 10 Meg response for the 2 mm needle hydrophone. So how do we evaluate hydrophone directional response? We begin by considering the transducer the acoustic axis of which is shown. We'll introduce a hydrophone such that the active element is on the acoustic axis of the transducer. And we'll rotate that hydrophone about its active element. We do this to ensure that we're not translating the hydrophone active element into or out of the beam of the transducer. This way, by looking at the voltage received on the hydrophone, we can consider its output as a function of angle of incidence. By using Fourier techniques, we can separate out the different frequency components of the source signal, and therefore we can get our directional response as a function of frequency and a function of angle of incidence. However, to get optimum benefit out of this, we need a really broadband acoustic signal. Let's consider that waveform. If we have a look here, we can see a waveform that was originally a one megahertz sinusoid driven at reasonable amplitude. The waveform's then been allowed to propagate considerable distance in the water so that we've got a lot of acoustic nonlinearity occurring. 
This nonlinear propagation has led to considerable asymmetry in the waveform and a lot of harmonic generation. The spectrum of this signal has frequency components that extend well beyond 100 MHz. In fact, let's look at a few cycles in detail to consider the asymmetry. We can clearly see that in addition to the peak positive excursion being much greater than the peak negative excursion, we also have a much sharper peak positive signal rather than peak negative. In fact, if we look at the spectral components needed to make up this signal, we find that most of the high frequency energy of the signal is contained within the positive peaks, whereas the low frequency energy is contained within the negative peaks. This means that if we're seeing directional effects, it should have a more significant effect on the peak positive than on the peak negative excursions. Let's look at that on an oscilloscope trace. So we start off with a hydrophone that is oriented at 90 degrees to the incident beam. We will then rotate the hydrophone around so that the normal is pointing along the beam axis. And we will then finish with the hydrophone at 45 degrees off on the other side. Let's consider that as we rotate around. Lots of change at the peak positive, but very little change in the peak negative excursion. We'll look at that one more time. So when we're at 90 degrees angle, we've got a dramatically reduced peak positive. This becomes dramatically sharper as we move towards normal incidence, so naught degree incidence, and then reduces on the peak positive on the other side, whereas the change in the peak negative will be minimal. We can also consider directivity as being a surface. This allows us to see the variation both as a function of angle of incidence and frequency. This is the directivity surface for the 0.2 millimeter needle hydrophone we were looking at previously. We can see at low frequencies, we have a very broad response. But as frequency starts to increase, we see a very dominant main lobe and then secondary lobes. And between the primary and secondary lobes, we have nulls. At very high frequencies, we can start to see the emergence of tertiary lobes as well. Now let's consider spatial averaging. We'll begin with a transducer that's radiating an ultrasonic beam. We'd like to map that beam by translating a hydrophone active element in front of it. Recall that a hydrophone's output is proportional to the average pressure or the integral of pressure received over its hydrophone active element. Therefore, the output of the hydrophone will start to be non-zero when the right-hand edge of the hydrophone active element encounters the beam, and will only return to zero once the left-hand edge leaves the beam. As is common, we report the position of the hydrophone as being the center of the hydrophone active element. We'll now do the same with a smaller hydrophone active element. Once again, reporting its position as being the center of the hydrophone active element. We see that signal starts once the right-hand edge enters the beam and finishes once the left-hand edge leaves the beam. But because the element is much smaller, we end up with a much narrower beam profile. Also, because we're averaging over a smaller area, there's less opportunity for destructive interference effects to occur because most of the wave fronts arriving at the hydrophone active element are almost in phase. This means that we end up with a higher amplitude. Therefore, by using a large sensor, we've inadvertently underestimated amplitude and overestimated beam width. If we only had that one large sensor available, we'd be unaware of the errors in our measurement. There are some mathematical spatial averaging corrections but it's important to realize that they're mathematically complex. And they also rely upon assumptions about the geometry of both source transducer and receiving hydrophone. And sometimes the experimental facts and these assumptions are inconsistent. Therefore, as a general policy, spatial averaging is something that should best be avoided. Where possible, don't try to correct for it, but make a measurement with the smallest hydrophone you can to minimize spatial averaging artifacts.
So to conclude this tutorial, we've seen that a hydrophone is more directional when the active element is large relative to wavelength. And larger hydrophones exhibit more spatial averaging. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.